Take your Bible, I want you to, while I do this, take your Bible, turn to uh, Judges chapter 7. Judges chapter 7, let me get that going there, there we go. And, boy, I wrestled, I wrestled and wrestled, wrestled with God over the message. And uh, so I, I guess maybe for your benefit, I only got four places in the Bible to go to today. Instead of the usual 20 or 30. That don't hurt nobody, does it? We need more Bible, not less. Which is kind of what the message is about. Judges chapter 7. This life of Gideon, the story of Gideon. And his character. And what God shows us through this man's life. Remember, he's not any different. We call these guys the heroes of the Bible. But they're not really any different than you or I. They're human. They are, they're born out of the same dirt. They were shaped in sin, fashioned in iniquity, just like we are. Gideon has his share of problems. He has his share of doubts and insecurity. He says, you know, I, 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 are you sure you picked the right one? I mean, my family's poor, and I'm the least one in my family, surely. And I've said this to God. Surely you could pick somebody else. Surely you have somebody else in mind. Surely there's somebody who is a lot better than me to do what it is that you asked me to do. God, I think you got the wrong one. And the Bible says the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. God, when he calls somebody, when he gives them a gift, he's never sorry that he's done that. God has already foreseen your future and God has taken that into account. He knows you. He knows what kind of person you are. He knows not only what you have done, he also has a record of what you will do. You just don't know the record yet. You haven't got to it yet, but you're going to. And God is never, ever wrong on that. God, again, God picked Gideon simply because he was the least and not the most. He was not one of the leaders. He was not one of the politicians. He was not one of the speech makers. He was not anybody of any substance whatsoever. He was of the poorest and of the lowest among the people of Israel. And yet God used him. And so now Gideon naturally has a lot. Instead of Gideon being somebody all cocky and arrogant and say, well, God called me. I'm just going to run with this thing. Instead of Gideon being that way, we see Gideon's nature in that he is always asking God, God, will you show me again? Are you sure that this is the right way? Gideon wanted the sign from the angel. So the angel gave him the sign. Then he says, I'm going to lay a fleece out. He lays the fleece out. Then he says, God, can I do it again? God lets him do it again. So now we're to the point. He builds an army. And then God says, Gideon, you got too many people in that army. We're going to bring it down. That's what we talked about last Sunday. We're going to bring it down to about 300 people. 300 spot on. And we're going to, this is how we're going to do this thing. How you and I, watch this now. How you and I fight our battles is different than how God fight, fights them. And I'm going to say this. There is on this earth no cure for sin. On this earth, whatever your sins are, your repeated sins, you might call them habits, bad habits, addictions, call them whatever you want. They're repeated sins. And on this earth, there is no cure for that. Roy, is there a cure for alcoholism? If there was, he'd be first in line. Especially if it was a shot of whiskey with it. But that would, there'd be no, there's no cure for alcoholism. There's no cure for being a drunk. There's no cure for being a whoremonger. There's no cure for being a dope addict. There's no cure for being stupid. Or what God calls foolish. There's no cure for that. So these things in life, they must have a cure from a source that is not available anywhere on this earth. It can only come from heaven. Now, do you know somebody who is battling sin right now? They're lost, and they will, unless God intervenes, they will die and go to hell. 
Do you know somebody like that? They're bad. The, old, the older we get, the more the sin is not fun anymore. Right? But you're still doing it. Your body can't hold up to that. Your body can't keep up with what your mind wanted it to do 20, 30, 40 years ago, 50 years ago. Can't do it. And if you know somebody today, they're battling enemies that they will not defeat. So think of them. I mean, Ephesians 6 tells us, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Prince Paul we're teaching on that on Sunday night. We're wrestling this. We as Christians are wrestling these things. And we've been given armor to do it. We've been given heavenly armor to do this with. Meaning that we're guaranteed that we're going to win. But. Who do you know that does not have that? They don't have your armor. They don't have your, they're not battle ready. They do not have from heaven what it is that you have. And they are going to lose that battle. They're going to lose it. Do you think of them? You should. This last election we had, Missouri very stupidly, Voted in marijuana. Three bills, and one of them was destined to become law. Three, med three marijuana bills on a Missouri ballot, and they did that on purpose, knowing that at least one of them would get passed. Wasn't possible to all three. One of them got. Illinois did something, I think, stupider than that. But they're Illinois. They said that the school districts in Illinois will not allow the teachers to carry firearms in the schools. They will not allow them. They will not train them. They will not teach them how to use it. And for the time being, until something changes... If you are a school teacher, you are banned from protecting yourself while you are in a school where you work. You are banned. If I was one of these crazed idiots waiting to get into a school to shoot up children, I would go to Illinois. I don't know if it's how well it's working. I haven't followed up with it in Missouri. But hopefully we got a little bit better sense than that. And Missouri schools would say, we're going to train our teachers to be the first line of defense in our schools so that if somebody comes in meaning harm to these children, we have trained people on the site ready to deal with this. You know what they said? They're teachers, not police officers. That's what they said in Illinois. They're teachers. Yeah, I understand that maybe some of the teachers wouldn't want to do this, but I guarantee you, you've got teachers in every school building in Illinois that would love and give themselves in the, and willingly put themselves in harm's way to protect those children. You, I'm going to say it. You're, that I'm aiming this so right over the Mississippi River. You're stupid. Amen. You're foolish for doing that. Get amen. A amen. They're guns and banks. Hey, you know what that says? We love money more than we love children. Thank you for that. Now, I just set you up for the message. Got you to amen it, right? Judges chapter 7, verse 15. 
I, 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 I've skipped over the part where God showed Gideon the dream. I didn't, I didn't get a message on that last night. This is what I got. And it was so when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and the interpretation thereof that he worshipped. See that? That's what I had in my mind this morning when we sang holy, holy, holy. He, when he heard it, he stopped what he was doing and he worshipped. Let me tell you something. Listen to me. Hey, church, listen to me. There's a lot of, lot of this going on. Whatever God does for you, stop and worship. Take a minute. There's no prescribed amount of time that you have to spend in order to make it worship. But if God does something really good to you and for you and through you, stop for a minute and say, God, thank you. God, thank you for that. You came to church today. Hopefully you stop just for a minute and say, God, thank you for letting me have the health to come here today. Thank you for not letting it snow and ice all over the place so we could come into the house of God. Sterling, I wanted to thump him last Sunday because he showed up for church. The man just had surgery. He's had a heart attack and he's had surgery right after that. And you know what he said? He heard this from a preacher that I know. I said, why are you here? He said, the first Sunday was easy. Was, it was hard to miss church. The second Sunday was easy. I wasn't going to miss today. And I went, I've heard that before. I think I've heard that in a message before. He had to stop and spend time to worship God for bringing him through the heart attack which they said wasn't a heart attack. It was a heart attack. I was watching it. And through the surgery, right after that, God brought him through that, and he had to stop to worship God before he did anything else. Okay? I, I like having leaders in our church that will lead the right way. Okay, I'm not puffing this man up, but he did the right thing. If God does something good to you, in you, for you, and through you, then stop and worship him. And tell him thank you. Okay? Listen, you'll get the next one as undeserved as you got this blessing, but it just shows that you're right with God because you're doing it, not because you have to. You're doing it because you want to. Every time I give the little ones candy, if there's an adult standing there, they say, what do you say, Courtney? Uh-huh. Gwen, tell Papa thank you. And she's going, am I pretty today? I'll take that. But then... All of a sudden, out of the blue, one, one of the grandkids will say, thank you, Papa, without being told to. You never get over that. So just whatever God's doing, stop, tell him thank you. And then, he, uh, it, that he worshipped and returned to the host of Israel. Now you can go about your business. But stop and worship. He returned to the host of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has delivered into your hand the host of Midian. The battle's already over, over with. It's already done. It's already a done deal. We're going to win. He divided the 300 men into three companies, and he put a trumpet in every man's hand. I have that underlined. He put a trumpet in every man's hand. So that's where we're going to go this morning. Father, help me to preach this message. Lord, you know the struggle I went through, and I wasn't sure, and uh, still not. So, Lord, I'm going to ask you to preach it. I'm going to ask you to say what I cannot say, could not say, would not say, or say what I did not say. But, Father, you be the preacher today. 
Jesus, you come in through your spirit amongst your people, both here and in Kenya and everywhere else. And Lord, we just ask you to say what needs to be said to every heart. We thank you, God, for what you do for us. And we stop just for a minute and say thank you, God, for letting us be in your house and be in the presence of good people and singing your praises and worshiping you and hearing your word. We give you the praise now in Jesus' name and all of God's people said. By the way, we didn't, we didn't turn, we got a wave to everybody in Kenya. So everybody turn around, look at that camera right there and just, we love you. Amen. On Black Friday, we bought three more projectors. Because they were cheap. Okay? So amen. Now we just got to figure out a way to smuggle them into Kenya. All right? Because they'll tax the daylights out of us. All right, he put a trumpet in every man's hand. In my opinion, in Illinois, in those schools, those teachers deserve the right to have a weapon in their hand. They deserve it. If those, see, those teachers are going to do what was done at Sandy Hook. That woman principal went and deliberately got in between the gunman and those children and used the only weapon that she had, which was her body, to try to stop him from doing what he was doing. That principle, I don't care, she could be as lost and humanist and atheist and liberal and voted for Hillary and all of that stuff. But she had a natural affection for those children in that school. She loved them. And she offered up her life for those kids. It is not right to ask these teachers to love these children. And when harm comes in the building, you run and try... They, what, did they, what did they wanted them to do? When Trump came out and said, we need to give all these teachers guns. There was one school district up in liberal North New England somewhere that told the teachers to wad something up and throw it at the gunman. Or something like that. It was something stupid. What? Spitballs? It was something stupid like that. You're not going to stop that guy. You'll make him mad. That's what you're going to do. It's not right to withhold the only weapon that will work from people who will need it. Am I right? So we put a trumpet in every man's hand with empty pitchers and lamps within the pitchers. And he said unto them, Look on me and do likewise. And behold, when I come to the outside of the camp, it shall be that as I do, so shall ye do. When I blow with the trumpet, I and all that are with me, then blow ye the trumpets also on every side of all the camp and say, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Now he's telling that to his 300. And the 300 are going to circle around the camp of the Midianites up on a hilltop. He's got them all spaced out. They've all got a... a, a a, 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 a trumpet in one hand, and they got a pitcher in the other, and they got a lamp in that pitcher, and at, at a certain time, they're going to break the pitcher, reveal the light, and blow the trumpet. And God's a genius, because what's going to happen is, the Midianites are going to think that behind every light and every trumpet is 50,000 men. So multiply that by 300, what do you got? 300, 500, 1500 million, whatever it is. You got that many people fixing to come up over the top of that hill. And the Midianites said, we're not doing this. And what happened was, the end of the story was the Midianites all started killing one another. Because God sent confusion into their minds and it's at night. And they're thinking everybody's got a sword to the enemy. So they start killing one another. And they're all fleet running off. Well, that's the story. But he put a trumpet in every man's hand. Let me read through this very quickly. So you get, I, I like to, I, we always tell you the trumpet's the, the word of God. But let me read it to you. Psalm 12, verse 6. The words of the Lord are pure words. as silver tried in the furnace of earth. 
You see, he told him in Numbers 10 to make the two trumpets of silver. And those trumpets were for different things. Number one, if we're going to call the elders in, then you blow one trumpet. If we're going to make a battle sound, then sound the trumpets. That way all the men rise up with their swords and the spears and shields and everything and get ready to go to battle. Or if we're going to move the camp, then we'll sound an assembly and we'll get everybody gathered in. We'll tell them where we're going. But the trumpet made out of silver, he said, The words of the Lord are as silver, tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them for this generation forever. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11. Let us lay before the enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing sunder, soul and spirit, and the joints of marrow, and is a discerner in thoughts, uh, of thoughts and intents of the heart. I did not put in here, turn to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, having the trumpet is the same as having the sword. In this case, it's the same thing. Because when the Midianites heard the trumpet, they knew the sword was coming to them. And they fled. So, Revelation chapter 1. Here's John. Uh, in the, in the, he was said, I, verse 10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and, the, and heard behind me at a great voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book, send it unto the seven churches, which are in Asia, unto Ephesus and Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. He heard a voice that sounded like a trumpet. And he said, I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. The seven candlesticks are the church. And he said, uh, the, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks was like one like unto the Son of Man. Jesus said, where two or more gathered together, my name, there am I in the midst of them. And here he is in the midst of these seven churches. In the camp of the Israelites, you had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve tribes. They were all like in a circle deal around the tabernacle. The tabernacle was God with them. God was not on the outside. God was not on the north side. If God said he's in the midst, he's in the midst of them. Amen. Now, here's my point with this. He put a trumpet in every man's hand. Every one of those men deserved to have a trumpet. Because one man was not any greater than any other man. And the whole deal behind the trumpets was, when the trumpet sounds, the Midianites are going to flee. God has shown me that. The Midianites dreamed about it the night before. They know what's coming. Now I know what's coming. And I'm assured of it. And we're going to win this thing. It's a done deal. But one man wasn't greater than any of the other men. They all had the exact same battle to fight. And I want you to think of the people that you're sitting next to in these pews first. I want you to think of your wife. I want you to think of your husband. I want you to think of your children. Children, I want you to think of your mom and dad. They all have the exact same battle to fight as you, don't they? Wives, after a while you get to know that man you married, don't you? You know what he's made of. You know his strengths. And you know his weaknesses. And then think about the fact that your husband, in the same way, knows you. He knows your strengths, and he knows your weaknesses. And he's got a battle to fight the same as you do. And if your husband happens to be lost, he's not going to win that battle. And you know it. And he's going to die fighting. And he's never going to win. Does he not deserve to have a trumpet?
Think about wild animals. We can make we can make sounds that mimic the sounds wild animals make to try to bring them to us, right? In the same way, we can make sounds that would, when wild animals would hear it, it would push them away. Because maybe we don't want them near us. Like that skunk I had coming up to my deer stand. I didn't know what sound to make or if I should make any. But you see what I'm saying? There's a trumpet that if used would scare away all of those enemies that you're fighting against. You have one and you know it works. But what about your wife or what about your husband? Or what about the person sitting next to you? They have the same battles that you have. Same sins, same struggles. They have, it's, they're the same as you are. They deserve to have a trumpet. Just like you do. Gideon put, a, that's what stuck out in my mind, he put a trumpet in every man's hand. Because every man deserved to have the one thing that God said was going to work and push the Midianites away. Now, here's all your lost friends. You have lost friends? You have people you know, that are, you have neighbors that are lost. Right? They're good people. But they're lost. And you, because you're their neighbor, you kind of know a little bit about what's going on in their house. You can hear things. Or you see things. And you know the struggles are there. You've got a trumpet. They don't. They deserve to have a trumpet as much as you deserved it when God gave you yours. Which means you didn't deserve it. And they don't either. But you got one. Why can't they have one? Amen? You have family members, aunts, uncles, cousins, grandma, grandpa, or... Children that are fighting the same battles that you fight. And they don't have a trumpet. You've got one. They don't. You know that it works. And you, do you want your uncle, your aunt, your cousin... Your children, your grandchildren, your mom, dad, do you want them to go to heaven? Do you want them to win the battle that they're fighting? Do you want that? You see, I'm going to say something. I think sometimes we say, oh, that's what I want. I want them to get saved. But with some of them, you don't, you don't really want that for some reason. You too mad at them? Or maybe they know too much about you. Not, not too much about who you used to be, but too much about who you are now. And you'd be afraid if they started coming to church, well, they might say what they know about me. You don't want that. But they deserve to have a trumpet the same as you deserve to have the trumpet when you got it. Can I hear you say amen? amen? Michael, not Michael the archangel, Michael the radio guy, is making a deal right now where we can change the tower that we're broadcasting in Turkana from. 
The tower we have now is 30 meters high. That's 90 feet. Close to it. We're going to go up to 80 meters. That's almost 250 feet. Which means that without even trying, we're going to reach more of Turkana and Uganda. Because the people of Kenya deserve to have a trumpet in their hand the same as the people in America. The people in Uganda, and I've never been there, don't know them, but the people of Uganda deserve to have a trumpet in their hand the same as the people in Kenya and the same as people in America. We shouldn't, if God's not picky and choosy, we shouldn't be either. If Jesus died for the whole world, I think the whole world deserves at least the chance, the offer, to have a trumpet given to them so that they would have the same opportunity to win against their enemies as we do. <laughs> to whom much is given... What to finish it? What does the Bible say? Much is required. And I'm not going to tell you everything, but I'm telling you right now, much has been given here. Much has been given. And with that, much is required. And if God didn't think we could handle it, He wouldn't give it to us. That's the end of the message. That's it. You know people that I don't know. You see people that I don't see. You have contact with people that I don't have contact with. And they don't have a trumpet, but you do. Would it work if Gideon gave 200 trumpets out to 300 men? No, because that creates what's called a gap. And militarily, you always look for, even in football or baseball, when they hear the guys, when a guy hits a ball, and you hear the guy say, oh, he hit it into the gap. He was aiming for that gap. And he hit it because he knew there was nobody there to catch it. That was the point of it. If the devil knows there's a gap, I'm telling you, he's going right in there. So to give 200 trumpets out to 300 men won't work. We need 300 trumpets. Now, I had to think about where to get and get all these trumpets. I don't know. The Bible doesn't say. But thank God there was 300 trumpets laying around somewhere that he gathered up and gave to those men. You know I'm talking about the Bible, right? I'm talking about the Word of God. I'm talking about people, when you talk to them, do they not deserve to hear God's Word coming out of you? Now they have it. What they do with it is between them and God. But you gave them a trumpet. You give them the trumpet, maybe God will give them the light to go with it. So this is one of those evangelism messages that I don't preach very often, but it needs to be preached probably more often. If you know somebody and they don't have a Bible, they don't have the Word of God, they deserve it as much as you deserve yours. So what would it hurt you to offer them a trumpet? I watched a documentary. A guy that goes around, on the, he's on the internet, and he goes around all these places around the world and eats everybody's food. Well, I'm glad he's doing that, not me. Because some of the stuff people eat, <gasps> he ends up one of these nations around India somewhere, and there is a Sikh temple. These are the guys that wear the turbans. And I'm going to look into that because it's got me interested. Because they say that their head should be covered in respect of God. But our Bible says, take it off. So I want to know what's behind it. That's what got me interested. But here's the Sikh temple. In the midst of all these people that are Sikhs, 
or Hindus or Muslims or Buddhists. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, whoever wants a meal can go in there and get one for free. All the people that are in there are volunteers. All the food is donated. They have people washing plates. They have people stirring up the biggest pot I've ever seen in my life full of lentils. Melissa would be perfect for that one. And whoever walks in, wash their hands, they get a plate. Doesn't matter if they're Buddhist, doesn't matter if they're Hindu, doesn't matter if they're Sikh, doesn't, ma doesn't matter. And every one of those people are going to die and go to hell. Because they're worshiping the wrong God. And yet, they're doing good to their neighbor better than we are sometimes. And that's embarrassing. Everybody deserves to have a trumpet. Amen.